Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma. Michael is the author of So Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, The Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. To the brightness within you and the truth that is rooted within me. Hi and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with The Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice. Our calling number is 646. 646- 200 4169. Press 1 to be put into queue to talk to Michael. We'd love to have your questions and your comments. We do already have someone on the switchboard with their hand up, so if you'll hold just a moment, we'll be right with you. And today is Memorial Day celebration 201. And welcome to our show. Hi, Michael. Hey, sweetie. And welcome everybody to the show. It's a privilege and an honor to be with you uh, once again. And Our Memorial Day celebration includes an invitation, as we do every day since Memorial Day 201 days ago is, let's join in putting an end to war on planet Earth. Let's create a space where human life shows up instead of this insanity that uh, has been happening on the planet for too long. I love Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So we're going to invite you to do something different and be part of the team that changed the world that uh, assists in shifting this whole dynamic of guilt and fault and blame and hostility and rage and fear by taking responsibility, a rather unusual thing for a human being to do. Gee, here I stand in this situation with this person who's the problem in my life. If they just change, then everything would be wonderful. But if they won't, I will puke on them. Well, why do I do that? Because in me, there is that particular quality of energy, that particular quality of rage or whatever it happens to be. And when I engage in the process of actual forgiveness, not the game the world plays of letting myself or everybody else off the hook because there's a particular energy in me, but actually going inside of me and finding the part of me that I've hidden from myself and myself and turned into a picture of someone else, when I find that part of me and I decide to be responsible for and change that part of me, then I remove one more vote for war on planet Earth. And each vote removed shifts the energy, and critical mass is coming fast. It's coming down the pike. And so we invite you today and every day to take just one issue. One, it doesn't matter the smallest irritation in your world. And actually dig out the forgiveness worksheet, the reality management sheet, and do that process. If you don't know about that process, if you're new to the show, we're delighted that you're here. We're here to support you in it. And if you go to our website, www.whyagain.com, on the right-hand side, you'll see a link that says Download Worksheets. It's about the sixth link down. And the first four links under that section will tell you all about the forgiveness process. It will give you the, uh, the worksheet itself, uh, Chapter 24 of my book, and two radio shows where we walk somebody from A to Z through the whole re- reality management or forgiveness process. And so you've got two sets of instructions there for how to delve into the part of your mind that plays the game that somebody else causes what happens inside of me, and it will show you exactly how to remove that. When we get enough people who will do that, we will kick the the critical mass to another level. We'll shift out of the insanity, and all of a sudden human life will show up in mass on planet Earth. So we're glad you're with us, and uh, Dr. Tim, are you with us today? Yes, I am. Awesome, awesome. You must have got your Friday appointment shift shifted. Yep, it's Tuesday that I have the biggest problem with, but uh, I have uh, the second Friday of the month I usually can't be here, but I try to be here most other days. 
Well, we certainly appreciate the support that you are and the input that you have to the whole process. And is David with us today? Yes, he is. Awesome. Good morning, David, or good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, Michael, Tim, Jeannie. How is everyone doing? Good. Welcome from your long drive to North Carolina and back to Theodosia. For those who don't know David, David is the uh, center manager at Heartland, and uh, Dr. Tim's a psychologist up in Crystal Lake. Actually, the, the support group is now in Woodstock, Illinois, a little bit uh, west and north of Chicago. And so welcome, gentlemen, and we've got a caller, so let's just go right in and say hi to our caller and see what they're thinking about today. Jeannie? I think it might be Rex. It's area code 517. You're on the air. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Hey, Rex. Welcome. Yeah. Hi, Rex. Hi, Tim. Hi, David. Uh, hi, Jeannie. Uh, just a couple things uh, briefly. I wanted to clarify yesterday when I was considering going to sleep without the day before yesterday, as I was sharing yesterday, uh, I was considering going to sleep without doing those additional two worksheets. Never in any part of my thought process was I quitting. It was just a matter of thinking I was going to delay and uh, not do all five that night. So right. that was yeah. the only piece. And at the end of the program, Jeannie had, had acknowledged that she was glad I didn't quit, and that isn't even in my realm of reality. So I just wanted to clarify right. that. And and yeah. the other thing was I had a uh, – uh, I went ahead and did some worksheets in that genetic realm, and I thought it was very interesting. I I did, you know, as my dad, and then I did as his dad, and went back to the his Rex, experience. Rex, yes. Rex, yes. before you move on, let's just, for anybody that wasn't on the show yesterday, let's just oh, sure. explain that, that Rex was dealing with an issue that uh, his dog brought up for him. It included some hostility, and then when he did his worksheets around the dog, he found out that his hostility was really a, a genetic uh, environmental thing that related to dad. And so uh, he's talking about he went in and was going to – one of the things we suggest you do is you can do vicarious worksheets. So he went in and, and uh, did a worksheet as dad or maybe more than one and as grandpa. So what what was the upshot of that, Rex? Well, it was just, it was an interesting dynamic because the themes were very similar, which I would, you know, I would anticipate. But there was some, I guess the, there was realness to it, uh, connecting with my grandfather from a much different perspective, more from his perspective. And, and, then, and then never having met or even known, I don't even know the name of his father, um, but having from a German heritage, um, that background. Just, you know, just some things came out and, and nothing that was really huge and dramatic, but have felt like I made huge shifts in my own reality-based structure and genetic structure and woke up today with pain all over my body. <laughs> awesome. Yep. That's fantastic. I was sharing that with Mitzi, and she just laughed. She said, well, you did break through a whole bunch of stuff yesterday. And I said, yeah, my body might be just reflecting my own, uh, that part of me that still wants to distract. Um, but when you start doing the detox, pardon me? When you, start doing the de- when you start doing the detox, your body's going to go through the symptoms of what that was like when it went in. You're doing dad, you're doing grandpa. You'll literally, if you were to to talk to them, you'd find that some of those symptoms you experienced, and the, and the pain in the areas that you you experienced them were probably precisely what they had experienced. And that's so true, Michael. As a caveat, when I was sharing the story about working with my client, um, when I was working on him, I knew that the things that I was moving through was related to his experience as well, from his perspective, because it was very similar. And when he got on the table and I started doing the body work and, and the breathing and so forth, the energy work, um, he, I asked him, I, I always ask as a standard policy, anything physically that you feel you're working on, any pains or anything that's happened or blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, yeah, I got this pain in my left shoulder. And I said, I smiled because that's exactly where I've been having the pain and having the pain. 
And so I went to work on it, and Larry and I said, well, give me the pinpoint. And I put my finger right on it, and then I smiled, and I, after I did a little work with it, I put my finger in that exact. I'm not, telling, I'm not saying that it was kind of close. It was the exact same tissue, uh, as close as I could determine, on my own shoulder. And that was instrumental also in sharing that with him. He smiled, and we smiled, and then he was able to move through just tremendous process. And I didn't share that yesterday, but that's related to what you're talking about. You know, it's mirrored. Yeah. So it's, it's exciting and uh, uh, it's good stuff and, and, and great job on encouraging all of us to do the five sheets because they're very powerful. And, and I am, like you, Tim, I have uh, I have less, but I have had resistance to doing these new sheets. Um, but I'm sticking with them and, and going to keep working with it. And uh, once I get through any of my preconceived ideas or my attachments to how it should be, um, then I'll give you my feedback. So I'm still cool. working out the Fabulous. detail. That's awesome. You know, one of uh, actually one of Jeannie's favorite exercises throughout all of the intensives, and maybe you want to share a little bit of Jeannie about uh, your experience of that, was to look at your power person, which you know, in all our work together over the years, Rex, it sounds like it's dad, and Absolutely. actually take the time, do a breath session, breathe into his space become him and write his life story in his hand from his perspective. And oh. that opens a lot of insight for people. I mean, literally, you know, when I was a kid, here's what my life, here's what my dad, and da, 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 and, and uh, it, it really opens huge insight. That's an exercise we do in the codependence to interdependence intensive. So Very that good. might be an interesting thing to add to the worksheet you're doing around dad and grandpa. Write both their stories and see what uh, what comes. And invite them. I know we had a woman at Heartland several years ago, and she was dealing with um, with some pain in her body. And as she was writing, actually a mind shifter, she wasn't writing that story, but she was writing a mind shifter, and uh, her hand turned into her father's hand in her father had been extremely physically, emotionally abusive, and all of a sudden she found her hand writing to her saying, please let loose of this. Your anger at me for everything I did is holding me back on my journey, and I need mm. to move on, and I sincerely apologize. And It was a major, major breakthrough, major healing for her. So you might find that as you uh, write those stories, you might get some direct communication from either of them and uh, and and add tremendous insight. You know, you, you listen to the ancient scriptures and they said, look to the lives of the fathers. Inquire of the lives of the fathers for ours are but a shadow of theirs upon the earth. And most of us yeah. never have an original thought or live an original life because we're playing out the highly charged emotional dynamics of our forebears. And it's only when we're able to let loose of those and as the scriptures suggest, inquire of those lives and clean it up. And as you should clean it up, gee, you get to do an original creation rather than replicate the, the past generation. So it so sounds true. like you're moving in that direction very powerfully. Yes we are. Thank you everybody. Cool and how's Missy doing? Um Missy is doing well. Uh, I believe she's doing much better and um, seeming to have moved through a lot of the deeper levels of challenges that she's had. And I believe she's doing well, Michael. Good, good. Well, tell her we love her and we hold the space and we just see everything working through. She's certainly got some heavy-duty stuff on her plate. Yeah, and it's uh, her sister's getting real close to the time um, she's put herself on the list to go to hospice. So she's, uh, and she takes herself off the list and then, you know, puts herself back on. And so it's a very confronting thing, you know, to make a transition for a person who's had such a long time to think about it. Yeah. And I, yeah. I imagine that, I can only imagine how challenging that can be in so many different ways. I was sitting with her and I encouraged her to, um, you know, it's, I said, you know, and if it was me, and it's not, but if it was, I think I would be really approaching anything that I hadn't resolved inside myself in my relationships in my life, and I would encourage you to do that. And if there's any way I can support you and help you in that, I'd love to. And we might, want to just, you know, we might just want to make the distinction that uh, we shifted conversations. We were asking about Mitzi, and now you're talking about her sister. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Yes. I think it's Mitzi that's going to hospice. And I'm actually sitting here on the uh, on the deck uh, on the intercoastal waterway with a young lady who uh, whose whole life is about hospice here in uh, Palm Coast, Florida. And uh, oh. Shannon Anderson sitting here on the deck with me. We're at her house with her cat and uh, just hanging out doing the radio show. And um, so, Shannon, would you like to say hello? Uh, Rex's uh, wife, Mitzi, one of the things she's dealing with in her world is that her sister has uh, some kind of a genetic disorder that I believe another sister has already passed away from. Is that, am I remembering that correctly, Rex? Yeah, they both had a um, uh, hepatitis C, and then Lana, her previous sister, died two years ago. And then Lana, her sister now, her other sister, is uh, hepatitis C and also Lou Gehrig's. So she's well, having a rough time. So this is Shannon. Say hello, please. Hi, Rex. Hi, Shannon. I'm so sorry about your uh, your wife's sister, but it, it, she couldn't be in better hands than with hospice, that's for sure. Awesome, and I appreciate the work you're doing. I, I don't know you, but just from you uh, sitting there and supporting Michael and the work that uh, we're doing and he's doing, uh, I appreciate it, and I appreciate your work well, with thank uh, you. people making the transitions because it's a very – powerful time, I think, in, in all of our lives. So thank you for what you do. It's wonderful to hear no, your voice. Well, thank you for saying that. It certainly is a calling. Absolutely. Well, God bless you. All right. Well, thanks for the call, Rex. Give Missy a very, very large warm hug for us. Oh, and um, send, uh, send love and joy to uh, Krista Joy and to Aaron and to our new arrival, Adeline Nora. Adeline. So. Adeline Nora. It's a Adeline girl. Adeline Nora. Yeah. yeah, it's a girl. Yeah. Beautiful. So at 7 in the evening, Krista gave birth. It was kind of fun. I, I spoke to her at 5 o'clock, and she's like, well, you know, her energy just sounded like, well, you know, I'm just at the grocery store shopping and looking and picking things out, and talk to you later. And two hours later, she calls me. So I had the baby an hour ago, and, you know, it was like, you know, I was at the grocery store and I picked up some groceries and a baby on the way. It was just like that kind of conversation, like nothing had happened. <laughs> so it was pretty awesome. So uh, well, that seems we'll, more we'll get ideal, to doesn't it? Post it on the website once we get up there on Saturday. So awesome. Well, God bless everybody. I'll get off the line so someone else can share. Okay. Enjoy sharing the planet with you, Rex. Thank you. Blessings. Bye bye. Ditto. Ditto. Bye bye. And, uh, Shannon, maybe for people who aren't really familiar with hospice, maybe you could just share a little bit about your hospice work. Should we open to that? Yeah. Cool. Well, this is Shannon Anderson, and we're in Palm Coast, Florida. You know, this wonderful place. You could probably hear the uh, waves. The boat just went by, and so the waves are splashing up against the rocks. For those who are really concerned who are up there in that icy, frozen north where humans aren't designed to live, uh, uh, you'll feel better to know that it's probably only about 65 degrees here, so it's a little chilly and cloudy. So you may have to do some worksheets on envy, but it probably won't be too many with it just being 65 degrees. So anyway, here's Shannon. So, Michael, I've been working with hospice for 13 years as a bereavement counselor. It's been uh, the most fulfilling job that I've ever had. I think it's one that has called me to do my own <clears throat> questioning about what, exactly this phenomena called death is. What's it all about, Elby? What's it all about? So I feel blessed to have that opportunity. And I work with the I work with people who have lost their loved one in uh, individually in groups and my work with the Course in Miracles is very important in that in helping them uh transcend the move through their grief, which is something that is a natural process. But but it's going to bring up some difficult emotions. Doesn't matter how what you believe or how many times you've had a loss. When you go through grief, you're going to experience the roller coaster of emotions. So I feel blessed to be able to do that work. Of course, hospice is there for people when they have a terminal diagnosis, and. The nurses that I work with are angels. They provide a whole team of people to come in and support the family. I was privileged to have the hospice that I work with come in and help my uh, father-in-law die last year. 
And it was an amazing experience. It was a whole new dynamic for me as I'd always been on the end of bereavement and, and never actually been on a caregiver role. So I learned all new things. And I'm really glad that hospice exists in the world because I know that we can die it with dignity and peacefully in our own home. And I'm certainly glad that uh, I'm glad to be a part of it, and I'm glad that hospice is out serving the world. Are you familiar with Daniel Brinkley, Saved by the Light? Mm -hmm. So Daniel's doing some awesome work in the world, someone who was uh, in a, a previous uh, incarnation in his life was a pretty tough guy with, uh, with some pretty, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, painful credentials, violent credentials. And now what uh, what Daniel does after having a near-life experience, most people call it a near-death experience, but just like everything, the world's got it backward. Someone who has the experience of clinical death is not experiencing a near-death experience, but they're experiencing a near-life experience. Most people, by the age of four, in my experience, are already dead. And the clinical death that shuts up the mind of the body gives them an opportunity to experience themselves afresh once again, as the being that we all are, that awesome presence of love. And the people who do all kinds of crazy, violent, insane things who go through this near life experience and bring that experience back to their lives and their worlds, uh, they change everything. Everything has to shift and change because all of a sudden, for the first time since maybe infancy or two or three, uh, they have a direct experience of who they are. And, and if you want to know what that direct experience is like of who you are, uh, simply hold a newborn child. And when you tap into the essence of that newborn child, you know who you are and what you are. If you're not functioning as that, then your culture has destroyed your human life. And this work is really about us individually and collectively regaining our human lives. And fortunately, you don't have to go through clinical death. You don't have to go through the body's mind shutting up because the body has died in order to have that near life experience your your essential spiritual nature uh, you can do forgiveness work and each time you forgive what happens is you have a mini near life experience the carbon based memory system as we call it shuts up and at first it's maybe only for a second or two and there's something that happens and then the next time it's maybe three seconds and then a little longer and a little longer until you get to the point where you go, I like this. This just tastes good. I think I'll stay here. And then the struggle happens of being able to shut up the hostilities and the fears of the generations uh, and come into a, an actual awesome, delightful experience of yourself as the creature you were designed to be. And that is the essence of your newborn life. And when you have that experience, then it starts to displace the insanities that we've been brainwashed into in the world. Uh, and and it just, it, it changes absolutely everything. So if you uh, question the uh, value or the validity of doing the forgiveness process, uh, I just invite you to look at it from that perspective and watch how things change. I mean, we regularly see people in so much drama and so much trauma and so much pain uh, we regularly see people who are on the verge of suicide who start doing the forgiveness process, and all of a sudden, life turns to a delightful experience. It's not believable by someone who's in their drama and trauma game. We actually did a workshop here at, uh, at Shannon's house last night, and some folks there who were really in some deep process around some deep trauma in the world, and, and it's, it's hard to conceive of life without that trauma, if that's where we think we're supposed to live. I love the line in The Course in Miracles, and Shannon also teaches Course in Miracles, but I love the line in The Course that says, problems are meaningless, but don't tell that to somebody in the middle of one. <laughs> because when we're committed to it, it's our identity, and it, it can be a big threat. You know, if you live in a, in a family situation, in a relationship situation where it's regular rage and grief and pain and sadness and threat and fear, it might be a big threat to you to say, and you know what, tomorrow you could be living without that. And the young lady in the workshop last night who got that 
And so I invited her. I told her I'd support her in five worksheets a day. And when we got down to making the commitment to do that, she just flat out said, no, I'm not going to do it. And, of course, everybody has the right to do what everybody wants to do. But when you start to throw that identity of victimhood away and you throw it away through the forgiveness process, uh, remember the Greeks have taught us we let each other off the hook for what's going on inside of us as though we individually have nothing to do with our lives. And I'd offer that. I don't care what your drama or trauma is, what your story is, what your pain, what you think everybody else did to you. When you start to change what's happening inside of you, which is the actual original Aramaic process of forgiveness, then you get to live something new. You get to experience something totally and completely different. And as we sat here, Shannon suggested that we call in the dolphins, and she just pointed. I'm turning around to look, and uh, uh, we've got some dolphins out here. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. So, Jenny, do we have any callers? And we'll just uh, invite the uh, the dolphins to come over and say hello. Maybe they'll add a little energy to our uh, to our show and to our calls. So, any callers or anything happening in the chat room, sweetie? We have a lot of callers out on the switchboard, but nobody has their hand up. Nicole asked a question in the chat room, and I responded to her. Of course, I think she's at work, so she may have to uh, tap in just occasionally whenever uh, she can, so she may not have seen my response back. She was in the chat room yesterday, and we invited her to do worksheets. She says, I did a worksheet last night, and I experienced rage. I'm really depressed today. I'm wondering what I should be focusing on. So I wrote back to her, and I said, awesome, Nicole. You're in a good place. The worksheets open the space to bring up anything you've not dealt with. And then I went on to say, anger is an internally produced drug to cover fear or pain, so I suggest you do worksheets on what is under the rage. And I asked her, could she tap into that? And because she said that she was depressed today, I said, possibly it has something to do with depression. And then it just hit me, and I may be totally off, but um, I said, there's no no coincidence that we have Shannon Anderson on the show today, and she does hospice work. So I asked Nicole, did she, by chance, has she faced a death or a loss or something that perhaps she's not dealt with, and she's not responded back to me. So, Nicole, um, I feel not good. She just answered back and says, I feel not good enough. Well, that's a pretty common. That's that's one of the ways that people who are into control, you know, one of the dynamics that we lay out in our codependence work is that is one of the pseudo solutions of the non-being mind is if I could just control everything and everybody around me, then nobody would get close enough to my pain and I'd never have to feel it. And when a parent especially does that with the child, one of the ways that that's done is to make the child or to, to instill in the child the reality, the frequency, the energy of I'm not good enough, I don't deserve it, therefore I'll be totally controlled by this parent. And I, I don't know whether that might be the dynamic. There could be many variations on that theme, but my input would be there's the core of your worksheets. And there's not much more, you know, when you recognize that the truth of you is that awesome presence of love that is the newborn energy, there wouldn't be much more depressing thing happen than to give that up for the belief that I'm no good, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve. And so, yes, the symptoms of healing are going to look just like that processing through all the pain of maybe the two, three, four-year-old child who gave up the direct awesome experience of love for a belief about self, for an image of self, a false self that we call non-being or ego, E-G-O, edging God or love out, uh, to give up the direct experience physiologically we are designed to experience our human lives, the active presence of love in every cell of our structure, 24-7, 365. And so when that's displaced by you have no value, you have no reason to speak, you have no reason to exist except to serve me, then when you undo that, that's a big one. That's, that's like some of the core stuff on the planet. And so we definitely hold the space for you and, um, are here if if we can support you in processing that you're certainly welcome welcome to call in our calling number six four six two hundred four one six nine 
and we'll support you in that worksheet and just you know maybe refining your understanding of what your uh, your actual piece of work is about might, we might be able to help with that so we'd be delighted to hear from you if though you're at work you've got the space to uh, to give us a call she's written in the chat room um after she said i feel not good enough uh, she wrote when she answered my question, had she faced a death or a loss? And she wrote back and said her father died, but that was 10 years ago, and said my dad was good, but he was sick. He was a drinker, and I get this from him. I don't know how to let go of the pain. I couldn't save him, and he was so unhappy. Uh, so so there are some important pieces. Uh, so some of the worksheets, Nicole, I'd suggest you do would be your feeling responsible, number one, for his pain. You weren't. And oftentimes what a child does when they see a parent in pain is they take on the role of, well, I'll make my parent happy. And the truth is, a person who's in that position who does not have the tools, does not know how, or refuses to do their work, you can't make them happy. There's nothing you can do to do that. But if you took on, it's my fault. If you, what, what the average person does, the average child does when they try to take on that role for a parent, who is inconsolable because the parent isn't willing to change what's happening inside of them. One of the, uh, or there are actually four files that we found that people tend to open in their mind, files, so to speak, realities. And one of them is, it's my fault. And I'm offering you, you're innocent, it's not your fault. The second file is, I'm a failure. I should have been able to fix this. And so there'll be another series of worksheets to do on failure. And then the, the third one that I've found many people open in their minds is, it's hopeless. There's nothing I can do. And that can be part of what leads to the depression because there's a transference from I couldn't fix it for mom or dad, and the belief is, well, then this just isn't fixable. And so if I apply that belief to myself, that reality myself, then I live in hopelessness and despair. And that tends to lead to uh, the depression that you're talking about. And... The other one is helpless. I'm helpless. I can't do anything about this. So I'm here to support you in knowing that you have as much power as any human being that has ever lived. If you go back and you listen to the man named Yeshua, he said, the things I do, you can do in greater things. So you're anything but powerless. It's anything but hopeless. And certainly... Helplessness is just a reality that can be healed. If it was acquired in the way that I'm sharing with you or however it was acquired really doesn't matter, it's just another healable reality. And you're innocent. It's not your fault. Your dad did what your dad did because that's the reality structure your dad had. And a lot of people take on the reality structure of the family system in order to be faithful to the family system. Well, this is just the good old family feeling and that's the way we do it. And I'd offer that you are not doing your family system any favor by continuing in that mode. The biggest gift you can give them is introduce them to a human life in the middle of the drama and the trauma to bring in the absolute active presence of love. Your humanness is the greatest gift that you can give to your family system. And that's what we're here to support you with. And, of course, everybody else, because it's not just your issue, Nicole. That's all of us. We're, we've all played that game to, uh, to some degree. That's the, uh, the condition of our culture and the insanity in our culture. So we did have a uh, dolphin swimming across the uh, the water from us here, and it... Uh, it was a mother and a baby. Oh, uh, was it both? Oh, cool. I didn't catch that. It was a mother and a baby, and she was actually teaching the baby to sleep because they have to, uh, they put one half of their brain to sleep, sleep at a time, and so she was teaching the baby to move and sleep. Oh, cool. Awesome. Well, I don't have the brain cells to have decoded all of that from uh, from the observation of what you just observed, but that's pretty cool. So, Jeannie, any callers? Anything else? Has Nicole got any other thoughts for us? Uh, Nick, we, we, can... do have a, we do have a caller on the line, but Nicole writes back and she says, he stopped drinking for many years, and then he got a sickness that they refused to diagnose, and he had a lot of pain, so he began drinking again to help with the pain that he was in. Yeah, I hear that one. That's uh, unfortunately all too common an experience in our culture, and, you know, alcohol is an anesthetic. The uh, the experience I have with alcohol is that anyone who refuses to forgive, refuses to remove the hostilities and fears within their minds or doesn't have the tools, doesn't know how to do it, 
sooner or later, and that's why codependence work ties in with alcoholism and Alcoholics Anonymous, is because sooner or later uh, the person who has no way to remove those stresses has to turn to something for some relief. And that's my my take on the root cause of alcoholism is to actually it's two-sided. One is I come from a family system that does life this way, and whatever the this way is is a way that's really out of harmony with the way the universe operates. And there is a power in us that's always informing us as to how we're designed to function and what our highest and best would be. A few shots of scotch, that voice goes away. And that's one of the prime reasons, I think, for people using alcohol, is to shut that voice up so that they can go on and do the insanity of the culture and the family system without the conflict of that other voice giving them information. The other reason why alcohol becomes uh, addictive is that it's an anesthetic. If you take two molecules of alcohol and you take the water out, you've got ether. And so when you put ether into the body, all of a sudden, you know, the old feel in no pain. But, of course, along with the feel in no pain, there's reduced intelligence, and we tend to do behaviors that add to the pain. So when one comes out of the alcoholic stupor, then all of a sudden there's more trauma to deal with, and it's a downward spiral because of the loss of the inhibitors and the loss of consciousness that comes with excessive use of alcohol. So uh, so we definitely uh, hold a space for your dad, even though he's not in his body any longer, to uh, to move through. Actually, there's a, uh, a book that uh, Shannon, who's with me here, sitting on this beautiful deck, uh, has written called Finding Ellen? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Finding Elizabeth. Uh, and Elizabeth is a woman in Celebration, Florida, who, uh, who works with people who've lost, especially children, and works with communication with those children and getting the relationship between the parent and the children straightened out. So finding a Elizabeth might be a book you might want to look up if that's a topic that's of interest to you. Is it available on Amazon? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you go to Amazon and uh, Shannon Anderson, Finding Elizabeth, uh, you might find uh, interesting if this is a, a topic that's uh, important to you. So, Jeannie, any callers? By the way, our calling number, if you have a question, comment, or thought for us, is 646-200-4169. Yes, and we do we have a caller. Oh, cool. Let's listen and see what they've got to say. That's it. Uh, I believe it's Massachusetts. It's area code 413. You're on the air. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, Michael. Linda here. Hey, Linda. Welcome. Hi. I wanted to just report in on... Um, tell you how things are going here um i called earlier in the week and um talked to you about it first of all this the whole thing evolved from a worksheet i was doing where i was annoyed at my sister for not keeping her word about giving me some information i needed for christmas and so i did a worksheet on that and it developed um into an issue about being truthful and telling the truth and you would suggest i do a mind shifter on um on truthfulness and it was wonderful, and I got a slew of worksheets out of that. And then stuff came up with my dad about one time when I didn't tell him the truth when I was a teenager, and he was reacted really harshly and physically abusively just that one time. That was the only time he ever touched me like that. And so um, you had suggested, um, you know, going to talk to him and, um, you know, apologizing for dishonoring him and trying to find out what was going on for him at that moment, that there was so much rage that that came out. And um, so I, um, before I did that, I did some more worksheets, and just all this stuff has been coming up. And I was with Julie yesterday, and um, it's like there's firecrackers going off. But anyway, I went to see my dad yesterday, and I uh-huh. was... So, yeah, I was so nervous. I was driving, and I, you, you, you would think I was being led to an execution or something. And it was, I was going down, down the road, and I was thinking, it's too late, uh, you know. Yeah. Like, but I, went, I got there, and um, I, he knew I was coming to talk to him before cocktail hour. So we sat down, and I said, um, do you remember when I was about 17 or 16, and I, I lied to you about, I was grounded, and I lied to you about going to um, coach my softball team, and I went to play. I went bowling with my friends instead, and I was in a really bad, hard place. I was in a lot of pain at that time. And he said, he looked at me, and he said, "I don't remember that at all." 
He didn't remember. Yeah. And I, he said, um, but I do rem- remember you raising a lot of hell with Nancy. And then I said, well, that reminds me. That was another lie I told you. I just wanted to tell you that I apologize for dishonoring you then. Um, and if I had been in a better place I, and I had tools, I could tell you what was going on for me. And he just said, I, I think too much of you to even think anything like that. And he said, I, I don't want you to think about it anymore. It's fine. And he was just so touched that I would even and surprised and that I would even apologize for something that I'd happened 40 years ago. And um, and I could, I was telling Julia this morning that I could, it's like I, I was sitting really close to him because his hearing isn't that great. And so and I looked into his eyes and we just really connected and it was, I've never noticed how beautiful his blue eyes were. And um, mm-hmm. it was just really, really nice. And I, and um it just felt good to sort of clean that. So I couldn't ask him. I don't know what was going on for him then, but um, it was really good for me to just um, clear that out and to, to face that, you know, like the fears that were in me all around, you know, being open. And um, I think the biggest fear was I was afraid I was going to start crying, you know, and uh, and I did a little bit, but it wasn't. And he had teared up too, but it wasn't, you know, I was able to just breathe through it and just stay focused on you know where I was at the moment, and um, so that was that was really nice. So I pre- I want to thank you for giving me that suggestion because I really almost talked myself out of it because a lot of other stuff came out about the look that Dad used to get that morning before I went over there, and I could see that the look he gave me, you know, as a little kid, it was almost like I could go back there and feel like as if I was looking into his face and seeing his myself in it and, and i guess i must be pretty disgusting and shameful if i was getting that kind of look i could almost feel what it was what i kind of internalized from that experience it was really that sounds like a couple good words, Pete. yeah it was that just, I'm when i got when i got down to i can see that all this stuff came out and so so anyway i i just want to thank you for for suggesting that and um well, that's an awesome piece of work, and and good breath. There's, there's some more other layers that are moving, and don't mm. be surprised if Dad has some stuff break loose. Oftentimes, you know, when when there's that um, disproportionate a response, like a, a man who normally loves and honors his daughter becomes that physically abusive that throws her across the room at the age of 17. Um, oftentimes, that it's kind of like it, that behavior comes from a sliver in the mind of some horrendous abuse, and it's compartmentalized and locked away. And, you know, if, it, if it's a one-time event, it tends to just be kind of like a sliver. It's under the skin, it's out of sight, and difficult to recall or get in touch with. It'll take some work to get in touch with it. If it's something that went on and on and on, that's the kind of thing that leads to multiple personality. And when that alternate personality comes forward and that sliver comes out with its behavior and in the, the kind of rage that happened that day, oftentimes it will be totally blocked from memory because it is an actual alternate personality that does that. And so don't be too surprised if you get a call from Dad and some stuff's moving and processing for him because you've just opened a fabulous space. And when you get two generations working on that level of healing simultaneously, uh, just awesome, awesome things happen. So that's that's powerful. Yeah, and you know, you had, th- thank you. And you know, you had said on the phone, you know, it sounds like you've got rage, you know, there's rage in your bloodline. And after I hung up, I remembered that my father went through this kind of midlife crisis. He's a dentist. He's not, he's retired, but he would have to leave his um, office because he would have these spells where he just, you know, it was just kind of weird. And he went to a psychologist and my mother said that the psychologist said he was sitting on a keg of rage. Um, but he never, I mean, he went a few times, and obviously it wasn't, well, I don't think it was resolved. I don't know, but I, I had forgotten that when you and I were talking, um, where you were, when you were talking about that. So I just thought that was, so hopefully, yes, the visit with him can open up and he can be um, relieved of some of that. It would be great. Yeah, and with, with all that you know in that regard, is your mom still alive? Yes. Yeah. So some conversation, asking her more about what happened there, and then the exercise that we suggested to Rex that we do in our codependence intensive of yeah. going back, getting into a really quiet meditative place, 
breathing into your dad's space and then writing his life story, what that was all about for him. Uh, from his perspective, you writing it, but as though you were him, and you might get some other interesting insights and uh, and be able to support him in in the uh, the genetics that are opening for you. As they open in him, it will open a deeper space in you. It's kind of you know it's the opposite of the downward spiral. If you've ever seen the movie The War of the Roses, you see a couple oh, of places. Yeah. That, you see a couple of places in that movie where they almost remember that once they had love for each other, once they function as human beings with each other, and they start to move in that direction, and one or the other will say the wrong word, and bang, they're right back in. And it's just like tuning forks bouncing off of each other into the pit of insanity. Yeah. And the reverse happens when you get multi-generations working on these issues is that the tuning forks take us into the depth of healing and empowerment, which is just a, a, a fabulous gift to give your bloodline, uh, to give your whole family system. And so, and, and it's pretty cool that Dad was receptive enough to uh, to be with that. That's just... I, I, again, one of the lines from A Course in Miracles I Love is millions yet unborn will benefit from the work you do. And that's what you're doing. That's that's what's opening when you do that sort of thing. You, every Everybody on the planet who has a mother, a father-daughter relationship issue, it just got a little easier to open the window to work through it by that piece of work. Mm. So thank you. Well, well, thank you for your support. It's so appreciated. You absolutely have our support. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Cool, thanks for your call. Blessings. Oh, what fun this healing process is. What fun. So, Shannon, do you have a thought for us? Well, I've been thinking about how significant the forgiveness work is, even in grieving, and how that that work continues long after your loved one has died. And the use, what you were talking, the journaling, where you step into the shoes of your loved one after they've died and tell their story, that's a part of what Ira Progroff, who is a student of Carl Jung, teaches. Mm-hmm. And I use that often with my grieving clients who have unresolved issues with their loved ones. And what what they 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 take the step one more step further is after they go through the process of writing their loved one's story as if they were them, they start a conscious dialogue with them because we know exactly how our loved one would respond. And so you just treat it like it's a script of a play and you write your name and you say, are you willing to do this with me, Dad? And then you write, Dad, and Dad says, you bet I am. I'm I'm right here. I'm ready to finish up that work. And and then they're able to give you what you maybe weren't able to receive while they were alive. And I do believe it's an opportunity for them to finish up the work. You know, it's it's like a 12th step for a 12-step program for a for our loved ones after they passed over, mm-hmm. that they have to forgive themselves for the things that they did to you. So in this journaling process, they have the opportunity to say the things that they need to say to you. So you are you benefit by the healing. So very much the forgiveness work continues. Well, well and my input would be that, of course, nobody ever needs to forgive themselves for anything because that's not what forgiveness is. That's pardoning, and if I've done something crazy, yes, my crazy words, my crazy thoughts that I poured onto you were abusive, perhaps. So I pardon myself for that, and now I'm going to go in and delete the crazy words, the crazy thoughts, the crazy behaviors that I played out with you and remove them from my family system. So That's on the other side. Okay, on the other side. Oh, exactly, yes. And, and whether in or out of the body, you know, Paul talks about whether in or out of the body, I knew not, for I saw things which I could not utter. We're eternal beings. And this, this, what you're talking about doing, Linda, and as we do this on a multi-generational level, and what you're talking about here is what in the ancient teachings was called praying for the dearly departed. Praying for the dearly departed is not down on your hands and knees going, oh, God, please take them to heaven. Oh, God, please do this. Oh, God. No, it's I do my work to clean up whatever is unfinished business in that relationship. And an interesting thing happens, an interesting shift I've observed is that when people do the work that is the unfinished business with those who've passed over, all of a sudden grief 
evaporates and what they go back to is the delight of that relationship. One of the things that uh, that I enjoy doing when I travel is oftentimes I'll be invited to do uh, funerals and I love doing funerals because at every funeral there is so much unfinished business with the person who's passed and that unfinished business tends to drag everybody down and I love to first of all address some of that unfinished business in the funeral process and then get people telling stories about their loved one. And it's just so awesome to watch people who come in somber and black clothing and down and, you know, like I'm supposed to suffer. And it's so awesome to watch them walk out of there lighthearted, uh, in, in connected space with that soul that's passed over and in aliveness. And certainly there's, there's always the hole and the, the loss to be looked at and dealt with. But as we forgive the capacity for loss, even that disappears and we're back in relationship again. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, if we're if we're stuck in the trauma of our unfinished business, then the still small voice of connection and communication with that person is simply not available. Finish the business often, we're right back in that relationship, whether that person's in the body or not. I absolutely agree with you. And you, you talked about Damian Brinkley's work, and one of the things that he experienced, and Raymond Moody talked about when I've heard him talk, is that, and the re- that's why I even said to you that their experience is that you almost, at, when you pass over, have an opportunity to review your life and to feel every hurt that you ever caused and every joy that you ever brought. And that it's not that you're being judged by God, but it's that you have to experience it and in some way maybe make amends to your loved one and perhaps uh, I do believe that they do have an opportunity to make amends if we're willing to be open to that communication and that they would certainly want to because they're seeing it from a different perspective, you know, from the eyes of God, from the eyes of, of an eagle flying above. Yeah, from the eyes of human being to to use your... So that that's... Uh, that's what I was thinking when you were talking about that. Yeah, and, and the whole idea of this work is to restore human life. I remember a woman that I worked with uh, back about uh, oh, 20 years ago. She was 65 years of age, and her parents were in their 90s, and both of them getting ready to pass, but the word death was not allowed in their house. And in our session work, she worked through that prohibition, that, that you know, taboo, you just don't talk about that. And her father was on the verge of dying, but nobody would, it was like the elephant in the room that nobody talks about. And finally, after a session, she went home and she opened it up and there was this big blow-up in the family system. But out of that blow-up, she just held the space and stayed with doing her work around it. She heard for the first time in her life, this woman was 65 years of age, for the first time in her life, she heard her father say the words, I love you, in his 90s before he passed. And then she shared that one of the most wonderful and powerful family experiences in all her life was when her two children and her mother and she were in a circle around his bed holding hands with him as he passed. And that she had a better relationship with him after he passed than she ever had because she cleaned that up. And it was just, you know, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps as I'm, uh, as I'm thinking about it. And um, actually, I, I need to contact them. We were down here last year. This is someone I've worked with three generations of their family. And she's now, uh, let's see, so that's, that was, um, she was 65. So she's now 93. And she's on the verge of getting ready to go. We went and visited her. I need to connect with them again, and uh, she's still uh, she's still there. Uh, but it's it's really awesome to work with multi generations. And I started working with her daughter when her daughter was about ten or twelve, and then worked with her daughter's son and daughter when they were five and six. And so it's pretty cool to watch the generations cleaning up and how conscious we can get and how we can live as real family and real human beings. It's just awesome. So thank you for the work you're doing in the world, and thank you for the, creating the space last night in your home for us to do that. Uh, why is this not meant to be again workshop? We had a small group here in uh, Palm Coast. It was awesome. And we are now on the road. We are going to be leaving here shortly and uh, driving down to Fort Lauderdale. And tomorrow morning we get on an airplane to go and hold in our hands Adeline Nora for the first time. A 
talk to my daughter after the the birth happened, and uh, she said that she was her daughter was extremely beautiful. Adeline was extremely beautiful, and then I talked to her last night, and last night her words were, "Dad, she's more beautiful today than she was yesterday." <laughs> so it was pretty cool, pretty cool. So we're we're looking forward, and we just invite everybody, if you would, uh, uh, Aaron and Krista, with their uh, new arrival, are uh, are getting ready actually to go home today. They went uh, at a hospital birth, and so they'll be heading home. So if everybody would just hold them in a blessing, and uh, we will extend that blessing around the globe to every newborn that comes into the world, that you have your birthright honored in your world, and your birthright is to experience yourself for your whole life as the active presence of love, to experience your caretakers, your siblings, your neighbors, the people around you as the active presence of love. And we hold the space for your birthright to be totally and completely kept intact. So many of us over the uh, the centuries have had that birthright ripped out of our hands and it's been lost. And we're working to restore it. And so we send that blessing around the globe to everyone. Any closing thoughts? We've got about another minute and a half or two minutes. Well, the only thing that I was thinking is that, you know, grief is a journey and it is a roller coaster of emotions and it's okay to laugh and it's also okay to cry uh, absolutely. and uh, yeah. it's perfectly okay to go through the experience. In fact, the grief is actually the part that we don't have control over mm-hmm. and uh, people shouldn't feel guilty for for not getting better faster when right. they're going through it because it is very much a journey. It is a process for sure, and uh, as we do our process work, things start to move in in some of the most unexpected directions, sometimes into deeper spaces. If you come from a family system that hasn't ever uh, been allowed to experience emotion, and especially grief and loss, and there's lots of that to process out and lots of that to move through. So, Jeannie, uh, anything happening in the chat room? Have we heard back from Nicole? Any other thoughts for her? Uh, no, there's no other comments in the chat room. And uh, nobody else has their hand up on the switchboard, so we're okay, down to and did we about two minutes. Okay, did we finish the last uh, thoughts with Nicole, uh, her last uh, comment? Did we address it? And uh, we're complete with her for today. And Nicole, we would love it if at some point you've got the space to pick up the phone and call us and, uh, and offer some support for uh, for that journey that you're embarking on. And, uh, and Linda, once again, we appreciate you for uh, keeping us posted on the process. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's very private, and uh, that you're willing to share it with us is, is such a gift because it's, it's, all, it's everybody's question. It's everybody's process. And, uh, you know, as we – I love the African proverb that says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I really appreciate everybody that's in this community that is holding the space for each other and, and then is willing when, uh, when the stuff comes up to uh, to pick up the phone to call in and say here's what's happening for me today and I need some support and this awesome community that goes from Singapore to uh to different to England I know and uh and all over the United States and Canada uh it's uh it's fabulous to be of support here and uh we appreciate everybody that's involved and we're down to just the last few minutes, so I'll just throw out that uh, if you want to do a, a week of work with us, we're going to be in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, starting on the second Sunday of January. We'll be there Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then all day Saturday. The schedule is on our website. If you look on the website, you'll see one that says travel schedule. You can pick up the flyer. We'll be at CSL in Fort Lauderdale. And then from there, we will be working at back. Anyway, the whole schedule's there. We're down the last couple of minutes. Uh, please bring a stranger with you on Monday, and not somebody necessarily stranger in the yard, but somebody who hasn't been on the show before. And uh, we'll look forward to speaking with you on Monday. Get ready to have the best year yet of your eternal life. Blessings. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice and his wife Jeannie, who present the internal Aramaic process of forgiveness. Michael and Jeannie are here every Monday through Friday on Earth Angels Radio. For more on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.yagain.com. That's www.whyagain.com. Evolving continuously.